Hi, everyone. So I'll be talking today about batch verification and proofs of proximity with polylogarithmic overhead. I'm Ron Rothbaum, and this is a joint work with Guy Rothbaum. And just in case you're wondering, uh, no relation. OK, so uh, what is this task of batch verification? So the setting that I want you to think about is the following. So we want to verify the correctness of k and p statements. Right, so we have KMP statements. We want to check that each and every one of them is correct. In order to do so, we're allowed to interact with a prover who we don't trust. And the prover knows the empty witnesses, right? So one trivial solution to this problem is for the prover to simply send over the K witnesses. And what we're asking is whether it's possible to actually do better. So, you know, let's try to be very concrete. So here's an example, right? So suppose that we're given k integers, n1 up to nk, and we want to verify, again, that each and every one of them is in RSA moduli. It's an RSA moduli, just a product of two n bit primes. So how can you do this? Well, the trivial solution, again, just send over the factorization for each of the integers. You can easily check that the factorization is correct and that it has the right form. It's a product, just a product of two primes. Can we do better? Right? So we have a verifier who's given the k integers. We have a prover who is given the factorization. And the question is whether the prover can indeed convince the verifier that each and every one of the integers is in RSA moduli. And to do so with better than trivial communication, communication that's much better than k times n. Right? So to put things on a, a somewhat more formal standing, what we're thinking about is an interactive proof. We have a verifier who's given k inputs of some language L, and the prover is trying to convince the verifier, verifier that all of the inputs belong to L. The prover, in addition, is given the k and p witnesses. We want completeness, of course, so if the, the, all of the statements are correct, the verifier should accept. If even one of the inputs is, statements is incorrect, then no matter what the cheating prover does, and here I'm talking even about a computationally unbounded cheating prover, with high probability, we want the verifier to reject. Right? So it sounds statistical. In terms of efficiency, we're looking for a polynomial time verification. And we also would want for the honest prover, in contrast to a potential cheating prover, we want the honest prover to run in polynomial time given these k and p witnesses. So that's the setting that we'll, uh, we'll be considering for, for the first part of the talk. And our main result there. Well, the TLDR is that we managed to achieve, we, to construct a batch verification protocol for a subset of languages in NP, subclass, a, sub, a class called UP, with polylogarithmic overhead, right? So what is UP? Well, it's just a subclass of NP or of all NP relations in which there's a unique, yes, instances have a unique witness, right? So this turns out, turns out to be a very rich class. It contains a bunch of problems in particular, a lot of natural problems coming from cryptography, things related to factorization, discrete log, and so forth. Okay, so that's the TLDR, the long agonizing version, well, not, not terribly agonizing, says the following. So for every language in UP, we have an interactive proof in order to verify that these K inputs, X1 up to XK, are all in the language L. The communication complexity is polynomial in M, M is just the length of a single one of the witnesses. So the communication complexity is polynomial on M. I want to emphasize that this polynomial is some fixed polynomial that depends only on the language L, doesn't depend on K. Okay, so some fixed polynomial that dependence on M and only a polylogarithmic dependence on K. Okay, um, so that's a communication complexity, which is really what we're emphasizing in terms of uh, verifier runtime. Well, you know, the verifier has to read the inputs. So that's this, that's this k times n uh, part that you're seeing here. In some settings where the input is given in an encoded format, then even that you can you can save. Um, and also, you know, the verifier needs to interact. So this poly m times poly log k comes from the interaction, and the prover runs in polynomial time. Okay, so that's the first main result. A couple of things I wanted to say about this. So first of all, for certain relations, certain UP relations. Um, so if you can verify uh, the UP witness and via a bounded up circuit or a bounded space Turing machine, 
then we can actually improve the poly M factor to just linear in M. Okay, so for a very uh, natural and rich subclass of, of UP, we actually get the dependence on M to be linear. And that is essentially optimal. So by results of uh, Goldrick and Hustad and Goldrick with Hahn and Wigerson, uh, one can show under very reasonable complexity assumptions that a linear dependence on M is inherent. Okay, so uh, that's the first main result. They want to contrast somehow, somehow uh, how it compares to previous work. So maybe um, first thing that I want to uh, compare to is what you can get via the IP equals P space theorem. So, right, so to check that K and P statements are correct, this is something you can do in very small space. Right, by, by reusing space, you can essentially check this using M plus log K space. If you then apply the IP equals P space theorem to this, what you would get is an interactive proof with very good communication, right? Communication has polynomial and M and then log K. The catch, however, is that using these uh, generic transformations, the resulting protocol would have an incredibly inefficient prover. Prover would, would be running in exponential time, even given the MP witnesses, the UP witnesses, right? So, uh, so that won't do. And really this uh, question of doing batch verification for UP with an efficient prover is something that um, we first studied in a work with, uh, together with Omer Reingold and Guy Rothbaum uh, four years ago. And again, the result there was also for UP and we managed to get non-trivial communication complexity. So like the current result, the dependence on M is polynomial, there's this poly M log K dependence but we also had an additive dependence on K. So really that protocol wasn't sublinear in K. Um, so that was four years ago, two years ago, we managed to uh, get rid of this additive dependence on K, but that came at, at a multiplicative, a larger multiplicative cost. So it was poly M times K to the epsilon. Epsilon was some arbitrarily small constant. And in this work, we finally managed to kind of get the best of both worlds. We get UP batching, with polynomial with communication complexity with polynomial in M and in log K. And a couple of things that I didn't include in this slide are works that consider kind of computational soundness, where you only want soundness against a computationally bounded cheating prover. Those works also typically rely on some form of cryptographic assumption, whereas our results are unconditional. And also a separate line of work that uh, from, from this year actually that looks at batch verification for SDK and, you know, so focusing on zero knowledge, which is not our focus. Okay, so that was the first main result that I want to talk about. And interestingly, that result is proved by a connection established in this prior work with Omar and Guy to something that's called sublinear time verification. So what's that? So at least here's the motivation. So suppose that you have some uh, a researcher who's trying to develop some form of a COVID vaccine, right? So she's working on, on her computer and you know, there's some huge database that you'd like to access and, and kind of compute on. And unfortunately, this researcher can't really download the entire database, it's too big. All she can do is kind of just random access to this database. So, so what she'd really like is to use, you know, the service of her uh, favorite cloud provider Cloud provider can download the entire database, do whatever computation is required and provide the result to the researcher. But our researcher would like to verify the correctness of the result and that can be done via an interactive proof. So is sublinear time verification possible? Well, it turns out that it is, right? You can verify things without even reading the entire input if you're willing to live with kind of a natural notion of approximation. And the notion that we're going to be considering um, is inspired by property testing. It basically says the following. We have this kind of this green blob. Those are inputs that are kind of in the language. These are inputs that we'd like to accept. Then we have the nearby surrounding area, inputs that look kind of close in, in, in Hamming distance, or we're going to focus on relative Hamming distance. Um, so this gray area, kind of no guarantees. And then we have the red area. Those are inputs that are far from having the property that, that we're interested in. And those inputs are those that we want to reject. Okay, so that's kind of the property testing view 
of uh, what we'll do. And our second main result is a general interactive proof of proximity. So proving to you that an input is kind of close to this red blob with the following properties. So what we show is that for every language in NC, so every problem computable by a bounded up circuit, has an IPP in which the number of queries that you do is Q and the communication is CC, where Q times CC can be any uh, kind of quasi-linear function in N. Okay, so for example, if you set both Q and CC to be roughly square root N, what you'll get is, you know, everything is, is kind of roughly square root N, communication, number of queries, runtime, and so forth. So that's great. Uh, different setting of parameters that turns out to be useful is when you set the communication to be polyvalgorithmic, and then this result would give you slightly sublinear query complexity. Okay, so you can get non-trivial query complexity even with just polyvalgorithmic verification. And that result in particular is something new. So prior to our work, there was a uh, work of, of, of Guy, Salil, Vidhan, and Avi Wierderson, which we really build on. And that work got a very similar result. So they managed to get the, the query times communication complexity to be anything that was like n to the one plus little o of one, where the little o of one is some, you know, it's subconstant, but not, but fairly large uh, function. And here we really get it down to polylog. And the significance really comes into play when you look at the setting, second setting of parameters where you insist on polylogarithmic communication complexity. So their result would give you basically, wouldn't give you sublinear time of verification, whereas we achieve that. And that turns out to be crucial in order to get our batch verification result. Second thing that I want to point out is that this result um, is very close to optimal. So in work together with uh, Kalai, we showed that you need the query times communication complexity to be at least uh, n over polylog n. And that's under reasonable cryptographic assumptions. OK, so let me tell you about how we do this. And really, the roadmap follows kind of an approach outlined already in prior work. So let's think of the eventual goal to get to this UP batch verification. In order to do so, we're going to leverage a result from this paper with Guy and Omar from two years ago, where we showed that if you get an efficient interactive proof of proximity for NC, sort of the, the exactly the parameters that we got in this theorem two, that would suffice in order to get theorem one. So all we need to do is get to the second um, rectangle, get intera efficient interactive proofs for NC. In order to do that, we're going to follow the approach outlined by uh, Guy, Avi, and Salil. So they showed that there's a particular problem called p value, which we're going to uh, define in a second, which is kind of complete for constructing interactive proofs of proximity for NC. So if we manage to just give an efficient IPP, interactive, interactive proof of proximity for p value, then you know, everything uh, follows from that. So that is indeed our main focus. And that's what, what I'm going to discuss today. So what is PVAL? So PVAL stands for polynomial evaluation. This problem is kind of, you should think of it as being parameterized by a bunch of uh, points. So x1, y1 up to x, t, y, t. We'll see in a second what these points mean. The input is, is big, right? We're in this context of interactive proofs of proximity. So we have this big input. We think of this input as being a truth table of a function f. Okay, and remember, we can only read relatively few points from the truth table. So what is the input in the language? So what we're going to do is look at this f hat. f hat denotes the multilinear extension of f. So the multilinear extension, just to remind you, is the unique multilinear polynomial that agrees with f on 0, 1 to the n, where you know we're working over some sufficiently large finite field. It's not going to the exact details, but some sufficiently large finite field. And we're looking at the multilinear polynomial over this field that agrees with f on 0, 1 to the n. So yes, inputs are those in which if I take my function, I extend it, and I look at a bunch of points, I'm going to see a bunch of values. So I look at the points x1 up to xt, I, I need to see the values y1 up to yt. Those, those, those are the yes inputs. No inputs are all functions who are far from this set. So functions g 
that are far from any function f satisfying these t equations. Okay, that's p-val. And it's going to be useful for us to view the multilinear extension as a tensor code. So this is a well-known connection. If you're not familiar with tensor codes, it doesn't matter, I'm going to define everything here. So remember the input is a truth table of this function f from 0, 1 to the m to, to 0, 1, Boolean function. And here I split the function into two rows where kind of the first row is the first half of the truth table and the second row is the second half. So in other words, the first row is what you get if you restrict the first variable, you fix the first variable of the function to be zero. You want to call that the function f zero. And the second row is what you get if you fix the first variable to be one. And we'll call that f1. All right, so that's, that's our input f. What is one way to view the multilinear extension of f is as follows. What you do is you first interpolate these two rows to get, you kind of interpolate each column individually. Right, so each column you are only interpolating on two points, you got a degree one polynomial. Now what you do is you go for each one of the rows and interpolate that. Sorry, you don't interp you interpolate that as a, a multivariate polynomial. So really what you're doing is essentially recursing. You're taking the uh, n minus one dimensional multilinear extension of each one of the rows. Okay, and that's one way to view the multilinear extension is going to be useful for us. Okay, so we're trying to design an IPP for p-val, so our input is the blue part. In our minds, we extend it to be the entire kind of pinkish part. And the claim is that if you look at these red points, just a bunch of, of points that are uh, part of the parameterization of our problem, you're going to see a particular set of values. All right, so blue is input. It's what we actually have access to. Pink is the multilinear extension, and we have the red, which is the points. It's good to kind of uh, keep this color coding in your mind because there are going to be a couple more colors coming up. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we're going to follow a divide and conquer approach, um, basically following uh, the approach of, of Guy, Avi, and Salil up to a point in which we diverge. So step number one, we're going to ask the prover to kind of decompose each or break down each one of these t claims into the individual contribution to each one of the rows, right? So essentially we'll go to each one of the columns in which there is a red box and ask the, the prover, what is the contribution to this column of uh, the two rows? So that would be the two green boxes, uh, two corresponding green boxes that we see here. And of course, you know, the prover answers and we can check that their interpolation is consistent with that. Okay. And notice that each box that contained the false claim before, the prover has to lie somewhere in the green boxes above in order to be consistent with the lie that it's trying to maintain. Okay, the question, you know, that's how we divide, how do we conquer? Well, following, you know, this approach of uh, RVW, what the verifier is going to do is take a random linear combination of the rows. So it chooses at random alpha and beta and you know, thinks in its head about the row that you get by taking the linear combination of alpha times first row times beta times the second row. Right, so we get a new kind of virtual row that we don't really have direct access to, but you can define it. And notice that the claims that we have on the green boxes can be translated into new claims about this random linear combination, right? So, so what, what do we have? We have this new input. It's distance. It's not hard to show that the distance of this new uh, row that we got, we haven't lost too much. So it can be, um, it's not gonna be much worse for, for sure than what we started off with. And you know, the size is half the original side. So that sounds great, you know, just keep on recursing until the input is tiny and then you can read everything. So that's pretty simple. Fortunately, it turns out that it doesn't quite work. And the, the problem is that we don't really have access to this new virtual row, right? Every query that we we'll want to perform to this new row will only be able to emulate by making two queries to the input that we do have access to. So the input is shrunk by half, 
but the clear complexity is doubled and the distances kind of stay the same. So we haven't made any progress. Okay, so that, that's uh, a problem. And the way that we are going to resolve this uh, in this work is by looking much more carefully at the distance, right? So for example, kind of as a mental experiment, it's good to think of a situation in which you have an input of p-val, so a correct function uh, f that interpolates correctly, and then you throw in some noise. You throw in a bunch of errors. These errors are denoted here by these boxes with the red diagonal lines. Okay, so we, th we threw in uh, a couple of errors. And if you notice, you can, you can see that in terms of relative distance, when you, you know, if you take a random linear combination and the errors appear before, then really it looks like the relative error has doubled because the absolute number of errors kind of looks like it stays the same, but the size has shrunk. So in terms of relative distance, it seems like the relative distance has doubled, which is much better than we, we thought before. The problem is that this is not always the case because it could be that our errors are kind of aligned with one another and then they don't add up. In this kind of situation that uh, we have, this example that we have here, the errors are kind of on top of one another, they're aligned. And then when you take the random linear combination, the error remains in the same place. You don't kind of gain the extra errors. So the problem is that errors could be aligned. It's a big problem. And the way they res resolve it is really inspired by a beautiful recent work by Ben Sasson, Kaparty, and Saraf, um, which is in the context of testing Reed Solomon codes. And what we're going to try to do is uh, randomly or pseudo randomly permute the truth tables of the functions f0 and f1. Okay, so that's the high level idea. Actually, implementing it turns out to be tricky. So there are a couple of things that you need to worry about. For one thing, you know, we start off with claims about the multilinear extension of f0 and f hat. If after we permute them, then you know, we need to translate the claims that we had into claims about the multilinear extensions of the permuted functions, which doesn't seem obvious. And the way that we resolve this is by carefully choosing the permutation that we use, we essentially use, choose the permutation to be a random affine map. The fact that it's degree one lets us reason about the multilinear extension. So that's how uh, we resolve the first problem. The second problem is that once we do these permutations, then also the claims that we have about F0 and F1 are no longer aligned. And then when we look at the claims that we get about this, the new, uh, the new row, the random linear combination, we're going to have double the number of claims. And the way that we deal with that is by introducing another kind of sub protocol that reduces the number of claims back to the same as it was in the beginning. So let's do a, you know, a quick accounting of where we are. Well, now with the random permutations, we can actually argue that the relative distance doubles, the size of the inputs halves, right? The inputs are half the size and the number of queries doubled, but then you can think of uh, the number of queries and the sizes canceling each other out. So re really what happens as you go along is that the distance increases. And that, that's enough so that at the end you can do things with very small query complexity. So overall, we are good. Okay, so to summarize, what we show in this work is a batch verification protocol for UP with only a polylogarithmic overhead, polylogarithmic in K, the number of instances. We do this by making progress on a different question, which is interactive proofs of proximity. And in particular, we get a result with polylogarithmic communication and a sublinear number of queries. In terms of open problems, one question that has really uh, been frustrating we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to, to solve is, you know, we have the sequence of works, all of them stop at UP. There's no reason uh, that we can see uh, that you wouldn't be able to get some form of result for general MP relations. And that would be, uh, I think, an amazing result. Or, you know, maybe, maybe there's a reason, an inherent reason why we're stuck at UP and the lower bound would also be very nice. That's one question. Second question, just in terms of pushing the parameters even further, can we get, rather than having a polylogarithmic overhead, can we possibly just get a constant overhead? So say 
that the cost of doing this verification would be 10 times n rather than n times polylog. And I'm fine with some additive additional uh, overhead. So that's the second question. Third question, you know, we have this result of uh, IPPs for languages in NC, so bounded depth or bounded space, SC is bounded space. Can you get any kind of result beyond that? You know, for P or, or higher complexity classes with, with say square root M complexity. Um, so that's it. I, if you have any questions and please feel free to contact me either in the online uh, part of TCC or via email, I'll be uh, delighted to answer questions. So thanks for your attention.